All right, so we're in Genesis chapter 50, and uh, we're going to look at the very last part of chapter 50, verses 15 to the end of the chapter. Uh, I'm going to begin reading that as you follow along. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for I am, in a place, am I in a place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. So Joseph remained in Egypt, he and his father's house. Joseph, Joseph lived 110 years. And Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation. The children also of Machir, the, the son of Manasseh, were counted as Joseph's own. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. So Joseph died being 110 years old. They embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. We see in this story, again, the unfolding grace of God. We recognize through the details of Jacob's life and now Joseph's life and death, the transformation of that God was doing in this family, the ones who had received the promise of the promised land. It began with Abraham, and then Isaac, and then Jacob, and now Joseph, and now we see it passing on to the brothers and the sons and the grandchildren of, of Joseph as well. And, and from this sort of final view and picture into God's heart and, and the truths of Scripture from Genesis, uh, I see really four things to walk away with that I think we can apply to our own lives. And I begin with the first thing, and that is fear. Fear, number one. The, the previous trouble between Joseph and his brothers, and if you remember, that was a deep trouble. Joseph, as, a, as probably a middle schooler on up, seemed to be the favorite of his father Jacob. And, and so much so that Jacob gave him that coat of many colors. He he, he loved him and, and expressed his love in so many different ways. It's not that he didn't love the other sons, but it, it seemed that he had a different kind of relationship with Joseph. And Joseph certainly loved his dad. And then Joseph shared the dreams that he had had as a young teenager. He shared these dreams of one day the, his brothers and even his father in one of the dreams coming and bowing before him. So much, so strong were these dreams that, that Joseph felt he could not hold them in, and he shared them. He, he didn't share them in any sense of pride or, or, or trying to lord over them. He, he probably didn't even fully understand the dreams, but he shared those dreams. And, and then even Jacob said to Joseph, son, you, you should kind of keep some of this to yourself. It sounds really prideful and, and kind of like you're on an ego trip to, to share these things. It's no wonder that your brothers are a little upset with you. And so, so upset they were. I mean, he seems the favored son. Now he's saying, one day you'll bow before me. And sort of like, who do you think you are, little man? You're the youngest at the time of the brothers. And so they, they took him, they beat him, they threw him in a pit, uh, they convinced Jacob that he was dead. In fact, he wasn't, but they convinced Jacob that he was. He was sold into slavery. Years later, they probably even believed that he was dead, for they never heard from him again. But then the dreams come to reality. They are literally bowing before him because in all of that interim, he has become the second in command of Egypt. And in that process, they now, in the midst of this drought and famine, come before him asking for food, not knowing that it's their brother because decades have now passed. He recognizes them. They come as a group. He looks like an Egyptian. He's wearing the Egyptian garb. He's, he's um, groomed as an Egyptian. 
And so they look at him and think, well, he's an Egyptian. He's the guy in charge. We have to respond to him, not knowing that the boy who was 17 when he was sold into slavery has now become a man, and God is using him in a, in a very powerful way. So, fast forward. They're reunited. Everything is wonderful. For years and years, decades even, they're reunited, living in Egypt in the same proximity. Relationships are restored. Forgiveness is given. And yet, the patriarch dies. Jacob dies. Now what? They immediately begin to think. He is going to remember now more than ever what we did to him. And he has the authority and the power. He's going to take vengeance upon us. He will meet out his revenge. And so we have to go back to him and ask, isn't it interesting how we have this tendency to allow our earthly fears to control us and warp us and change our view of others and change our view of situations? When you live under the authority of fear, it necessarily means that you are pushing faith to the side. And I would just encourage you to, to not live that way. So now, Joseph, you know, here's what's interesting. It had nothing to do with Jacob being alive that Joseph did not send retribution and revenge upon them. Why? He was the second in command of Egypt. He could do whatever he wanted to do. And he did do whatever he wanted to do. He showed kindness. He forgave them. He'd already done so. Nothing changed when Jacob died. In fact, he reiterated here again as they shared their fear, look, I, we're good. We're all good, and, and I'm going to take care of you, and I'm going to take care of your children. You're good. Relax. So what he did, he did what he wanted to do, and that was he showed kindness. So um, beware of your own fear. I think that's a thing we can learn from this. Um, there are real fears. I'm not saying that, that there aren't real fears, but the faithfulness of God and the, the hand of God and the leadership of God and the purpose of God far outweighs the fears that we might live under otherwise if we're a child of God. Secondly, in verses 19 through 21, we see forgiveness. We see Joseph reiterating this forgiveness that he has toward them. Um, just like when Joseph was young, they misunderstood him and they assumed the worst. Why is that? Well, I think it's because they were looking at Joseph as if it were them. If they were in this position, what would they do? Well, they would probably send out revenge. So in their minds, they think, well, that's what he's going to do. And doesn't that happen to us sometimes? And on our bad days, we, we think, oh, here's what I would do. And if it's not the right thing, we assume that everyone else will do that as well. I got rear-ended one time in my car. I saw it about to happen. You know, I was at a red light drinking my coffee waiting on the light to change. There were about six or seven cars in front of me. I couldn't go anywhere. There were cars beside me. And, and I was a sidewalk on this side. And I look up in the window, and here's a little, kind of little sporty car coming a little too fast. I'm thinking, hmm, hope they have good brakes. Um, you know, you just, it just kind of goes through your mind, you know. And um, they got closer. They got closer. And I looked up. I said, okay, they're going to hit me. So I put the coffee down. I put my foot on the brake, I put the car in park, I pulled up the emergency brake, I held the wheel. I didn't have time to get out of the car, I would have done that, I guess. And I thought, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold tight here and hopefully I won't hit the car in front of me. And thankfully I didn't, but bam, she nailed me. And it didn't do much to my car, I had a pretty good sized SUV, I think it bent my bumper, that was about it, but it destroyed the front of her little sporty car. Like her, her, her hood, you know, went from this to this, you know. And, and um, so I immediately got out of the car, ran back to make sure she was okay. And she's just blubbering. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. You know, she's kind of crazy. I said, are you okay? She went, yes, I'm okay. I said, all right. And then she started again. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I said, stop. Turn your car off. I, you know, my car was off. I told her to turn her car off. Now the traffic's going. It's kind of a busy road. We got out onto the sidewalk. We called the police. Her car was not drivable at that point. Mine was fine, but hers was not. And, and I just kept trying to be friendly. Number one, I didn't care about the car, mine or hers, quite honestly. I cared more about that she was okay. I was fine. I got coffee on my hand, which was a bummer because I missed some of my coffee. But other than that, I was good. 
And I just kept talking to her and trying to kind of talk her off the cliff. And finally, she looked at me and she said, why are you being so nice to me? She like barked at me. I said, well, if I weren't nice, what good would it do? How would it change that our cars are damaged? And, you know, what does that matter? It's just a car. And she said to me, I've never met anyone like you before. She said, why are you like this? And I thought, aha. I almost looked up and said, this is it, isn't it, God? You want me to do this now, on the road, with cars passing, the policeman's coming up at this point. And I just looked at her, and I said one word, Jesus. She said, what? I said, I'm a Christian, and I'm not perfect, and I make a lot of mistakes, but cars don't really matter to me, and so I'm just glad you're okay. And I think that Jesus wants us to care more about people than stuff. So that's why. She was like, huh, really? And so I, I share that illustration because I want you to know that when we give out kindness in a harsh world, we can only do it if Christ is in us. But when we do, people sometimes don't know what to do with that. She must have thanked me 57 times, and then she assured me I have really good insurance. I was like, look, it's a bumper. I think I can take a crowbar and bend it back, and I'm good. She could not get that in her head, couldn't understand why that would be an okay thing. I said, well, partly because the car already has 200,000 miles on it. Why would I fix it, you know? <laughs> why, would I, why would I even care? I mean, I'm amazed that it still runs, much less that the bumper is bent. It's really not a big deal. I said... Your car, on the other hand, you might want to get that fixed. And um, in which she, I'm sure she did. Here was the funniest part of the whole story. She said, you know what's really sad about this? I just dropped my son off at high school. He's a new driver. He's still learning how to drive. And the whole way to school, I scolded him about his bad driving habits. <laughs> I said, well, now he has a story to talk to his mom about. She said, you, don't you know it. I said, by the way, she, what were you? she said, I was looking, I dropped something and I was changing the radio and looking down and then I looked up and I, because I thought the cars were moving and they weren't. You know, an innocent mistake obviously on her part, but it was just one of those things. Joseph gave out kindness to his brothers because he had truly forgiven them for what they had done. And clearly states, you meant it for evil, but God, who is sovereign over all, providential, God meant it for good. And look, even now, all of you are still alive. My family still lives because God has placed me in this role to be able to provide food and now land for my family. God knew exactly what he was doing those many years ago. Forgiveness. Be willing to forgive those who have harmed you and, and move forward in that because it won't change anything if you don't. Number three, in verses 22 through 26, we see faith. We see faith as, it comes to the, as we come to the end of Joseph's life. From verse 21 to verse 22, there are several decades that take place there. There's a pretty big gap there. It just shows that Joseph was continuing to live faithfully up until the time that he died. And he he carried this faithfulness even into his death as he lived by faith. Now, A and B shows, uh, I just want to show the differences. There are a lot of similarities, but the differences between the faith of Jacob and the faith of Joseph. So first, the, the faith of Jacob. The faith of Jacob was a faith that looked back. Remember, Abraham and Isaac, Jacob's grandfather and father, had come from another land. Abraham had come from another land and taken up residence in this land that God had promised and said, look, all around, all that you see will one day be yours, the land of promise, the land of Canaan. It's not yours yet, but it will be. Then that same promise was made to Isaac. Then that same promise was made to Jacob. Jacob now has all these sons, and these sons will represent the tribes, the differing groups that will one day inhabit the promised land, because part of the promise was that your, the generations behind you will, will be of such a great number, you will not be able to count them. And so in that regard, we, 
we see Jacob looking back to the fact that they have already lived in the land, but now for a season, Jacob and his sons have been removed from the land just so they can live and continue. They're living in Egypt for a season. And so at Jacob's death, he says, bury me where? Back in the promised land in Canaan. Make sure that my body goes to be buried with my father, my grandfather, my grandmothers. I, I want to be back in the place where I have been. I, I know that this is the land God has already given it to us, and it will continue to happen. So for the most part, Jacob is looking back at the promises that God has made. Joseph's faith, on the other hand, is a faith that looks forward. And in Joseph, we, we see a very different picture. Why? When Joseph was 17, he left Canaan. He left the land of promise, sold into slavery. And where did Joseph spend all of his formative growing up, young adult, and now older adult years? In Egypt. He didn't, he didn't grow up in Israel. He didn't grow up in the land of promise, Canaan. He, he grew up in Egypt. And so his view of the world is very different than the view of the world of someone who has grown up in Canaan. His brothers all grew up in Canaan. They have that connection and that point with Jacob. But, but Joseph has a very different picture and a very different view of the world. And so Joseph's faith is a faith that says, you know, all those promises that we were told, and even Dad reminded us when he was dying, just know that, that you will, your, the generations behind you will go back to the land of promise and you will see the future taking place. And so his is a faith that looks forward um, the land where you are going. And so these are the two pictures of faith. Well, we have this incredible perspective now. We can look back to the cross and see all that was accomplished on the cross for us. That's us looking back in the past of what Christ has done. And he has established the opportunity for us to be forgiven. He has established the privilege of us to have eternal life. But we also get to look forward. Why? Because we live in the middle right now. We live in this painful place where things like Nice and Orlando and, and all the terrorism and all the health issues and all the marital struggles and all the financial problems and all the issues of immorality and, and sinfulness and selfishness that are in our world. We, we live there, and it's not a pretty place. We, we live in a difficult place. But we get to look back at the cross and see what God has done. And we get to look forward to eternity and see what God's going to do when none of the struggles of this zone will happen anymore. So we, we sort of live with our feet firmly planted in both locales, the past and the future, while we live in the present. And it's a wonderful way to live because that's how God builds our faith. You know, if I'm, if I'm always looking back, I, I may feel like I've missed something. I wish that I was living then. I wish that things were different. If I'm always looking forward, I, I forget that God has, has taken care of this. But, but as, I, as I live in the, in the here and now with balance, I recognize because of what God has done and because of what God's going to do, I have authority and faith to live now and make a difference and make an impact in my world because he's placed me here. This is where I live. This is where I live in brokenness. This is where I live in a broken world. And I'm certainly not perfect, and those around me are not perfect, and the church is not perfect, but, but, but God is perfect. And by his providential care and involvement in my life, this is where I live. I oftentimes get asked the question from people, how do I know God's will? How do I know what I'm supposed to do? And I think it's a good question. I think it's good to ask that question. I, I don't discourage people from asking the question, but I know what they're asking when they ask it almost always. They assume that when God has used other people in a powerful way, that at some point they had this very clear, crystal clear, 100% view, this is what I need to do, and then they did it. It's never been my experience, and those of you who have been living faithfully for years, you would probably agree with this. It's never been our experience that God gives us 100% of anything. I have never known for absolute certainty we should move in this direction. I should go in this direction. I should do this. I should do that. I should do the other. But God has given me somewhere between 51 and 100%. I don't know exactly how to quantify that, but when I've known that there's more of an inclination to go in this direction and there's a peace about going in that direction than not, I have tried to do that and I've watched God work the details out. So I would just encourage you, some of you are, are waiting 
you hope to have 100% clarification to move in a particular direction. Maybe, you're, maybe there's a decision before you even now as I share these words. Just know that God's probably not going to give you 100%. But he'll give you a peace. He'll give you a direction. And I would say when that happens, take the step. Take the first step. Move in that direction. Move in, in the way that God wants you to move so that you can begin to experience the plan that God has for you. Which leads to the last thing, and that is number four, foundation foundation. So fear, forgiveness, faith, and now foundation. In all of this, not just the story of Jacob and Joseph, but all of Genesis, in all of the Bible, what do we see? We see the presence and the purpose of God. The presence and the purpose of God. God carries his workmen. And when a workman is buried because of their death, he raises up new. That's what God does. He, he unleashes his purpose on humanity. God always accomplishes his purposes through people. I don't know why he does that, but that's how God moves and that's how God works. And so as we understand that, we recognize that we play a pivotal, a critical role in the work of the kingdom, whether it's in the south of France or the south of Florida. God has called us to make a difference in our world. All of us are people of influence. All of us have some people around us, whether they're our friends at school, our co-workers, our neighbors, our family members, where, where we have some level of influence and encouragement in their lives. God has crossed those paths so that we might, those of us who know Christ, might share the hope of Christ that we have. It's the only opportunities we have. It's, I believe, why God has left us on earth and not taken us on to heaven. As long as he gives us air to breathe, we have these opportunities. And when he chooses to take us to heaven, there'll be no more struggle, no more challenges. None of that will exist anymore. We'll be with him. But until then, we find ourselves with feet in the past and feet in the future while we live in the present, seeking to be the people that God's called us to be. So, if you're here today and you know Jesus is Lord and Savior, you, like Joseph, like Jacob, like Isaac, like Abraham, like Adam, like Noah, like all of these men that God used, um, you have this privilege to follow the plan that God has for you. You will not perfectly follow it. You will stumble, you will make mistakes, you will do things the wrong way that in no way changes the sovereignty and the direction of God. He gives us incredible second, third, fifteenth chances to continue to work with Him and learn as we go along. If you do not yet know Jesus as Lord and Savior, then this is a little foreign to you. I, I invite you to consider that what was accomplished on the cross, His sacrificial and substitutionary death on our behalf, is for you. It is so that your sins might be forgiven, so that you may be, might be made right with God and have this future hope that we in Christ enjoy with great freedom and with great contentment and with great understanding of what the future holds, no matter how difficult life may be in the here and now. Let's pray. Lord, I, I do thank you for this word of hope and encouragement. I ask, Lord, that you would... Um, continually teach us from the stories of the Bible. This unfolding of, of Jacob and Joseph's life sort of simultaneously and in tandem, father and son, and then the other sons who, who interact in so many interesting ways. Lord, we, we definitely see the brokenness of humanity in all of these stories in, in different ways. But we also see the plan and the purpose and the presence that you have in all of this so that the foundation upon which these lives were based is you. Lord, we are the same kinds of people that we read about in Genesis today. And you are exactly the same God as the God who worked in the lives of these people. And so I, I pray that you would meet us where we are. For those of us who know you, remind us of who we are. Show us the next step or steps that you have for us and and teach us, Lord, how to faithfully follow after you. We know that the plans you have are for the purposes of your grace and glory to shine, 
but the byproducts bring joy and contentment into our lives. Help us to understand and see that. And then, Lord, for those who do not yet know you in this room, I, I pray that you would remove the scales from their eyes, spiritually speaking, help them to see you, help them to see the glory of the cross and the sacrifice of, of your death on the cross and the love that went forth from you by way of the cross that we might come to know you as Lord and Savior. And I pray, Lord, you would open their hearts to that truth even today. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing together, and, and as we do, um, I'll be standing here. It would be my joy to talk with you if you have spiritual questions, if you'd like to know what it means to begin this relationship with God through His Son, Jesus, what the sacrifice, substitutionary death that I just spoke of, what that means, and, and how that is appropriated in our own hearts and lives. It would be my joy to talk with you more either now or immediately after the service. The front is open. I invite you to come and, and spend time in prayer if you are burdened about issues in your own life people in your own life or, or maybe a, another person that you're burdened for and you want to lift them to the Lord, you come as we sing together. Would you stand and come as God leads?
So after the crucifixion, after the resurrection, but while Jesus was still on earth, he had this interchange with his disciples. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And isn't it interesting? We've just been looking at the hope of the kingdom of Israel to come. Now, centuries later, when I'm reading in the book of Acts in the first chapter, we see that Israel has been around for a long time now. God has fulfilled his promise in establishing this promised land, but yet the Romans are coming and the, the, the kingdom, the earthly kingdom of Israel is being destroyed. And he says, they say to him, so Lord, now will you restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. For you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses here in Jerusalem. You will be my witnesses in all Judea. That's the land of Israel. And even in Samaria. Samaria, they weren't really all that close to Samaria culturally and otherwise the Samaritans were figured almost like half-breeds they were part Jewish but not fully Jewish and so there was a lot of discrimination and animosity there and even to the end of the earth you will be my witnesses and when he had said these things as they were looking on he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight and while they were gazing into heaven as he went behold two men stood by them in white robes and said men of Galilee why do you stand looking into heaven this Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Now we live in that time. He's gone, but he's returning. And in the interim, the Spirit of God has been given to us in, with full authority that we can make a difference in people's lives, that we can share the hope that is within us in Christ. And so my encouragement to you is live with the full knowledge that Jesus will return just as he left, but we don't know when. So until then, live with great anticipation of, of that returning. Live knowing that your life under God's authority really does matter. God bless you.